Wonderful. Well, thank you very much for supporting Dan and for being here. And I hope that this uh, presentation is going to be stimulating because it, uh, it started off about 10 years ago when we had a Dan Southern Africa member who had been diving in the Canary Islands and subsequently went to the United States. And during the flight developed tingling in one of the arms and went to a diving center and uh, had in excess of about five uh, recompression treatments uh, to the order of about $50,000. And the net finding was that this person actually suffered a compression of the ulnar nerve. In other words, it was a mechanical injury for which recompression had been provided. And that really got me thinking about how wise is it to really have the adage that pretty much anything that is not obviously something else as decompression illness after diving. And part of this presentation is going to be just to bring some perspective back on that. The second part has been the issue of divers in remote locations developing relatively trivial symptoms, but then in order to get them to medical assistance or assessment, uh, requiring a very expensive and very risky evacuation not to mention the disruption of their holidays and the inconvenience to other people. Now, whilst this could very easily become a temptation to a dive resort to underplay the presence of legitimate symptoms, the reverse sometimes also happens. In other words, where people have become so paranoid about the symptoms of decompression-related problems that pretty much everything is now bent. So, that's the background. Now, the bottom line is, of course, if you do spend time underwater at pressure, breathing compressed gas, there is potential risk. And we know that we have a gas evolution aspect, in other words, that gas can come out of solution. And we have a pressure volume change equation, which we know under certain circumstances can either compound bubbles that form, or it can, in the case of a lung of a pressure injury, cause bubble-related problems. So we've got two entities which, by the look of it, are entirely different. We've got decompression sickness and we've got arterial gas embolism. And I'm going to start off looking at them individually and then show you how blurred it can become. Decompression sickness, as you know, is the result of us ingassing or having compressed gas going into solution delivered through the arterial system to tissues and then subsequently upon decompression being conveyed from the tissues in veins to the lungs but in the process it's possible that based on the type of dive and uh, various characteristics related to the diver themselves to develop a range of symptoms including pain, tingling, dizziness, paralysis, weakness, uh, unconsciousness, a whole host of things that most of you that are instructors probably are training your divers on every day. That's all very well, but I think that we just need to bring some perspective into this equation. First of all, there has been a significant amount of research demonstrating the dose response and the sort of forms of decompression illness that we could expect. This is the John Scott Haldane facility and the goats that they bent, the tables that have developed and of course we all know that there's a difference between mathematics and physiology and for that reason we know that dive tables aren't 100% accurate and that yes of course there's a potential risk related to diving to the extent of about three to seven per 10,000 dives producing decompression illness uh, and may maybe one per hundred thousand dives resulting in a fatality, usually cardiac in nature. So obviously there is risk, but is that decompression illness? In other words, are the abnormal symptoms attributable to decompression? Gas embolism, the classic that we teach our students, breath hold ascent, lung overexpansion, pop goes the weasel, and as we teach them, Gas bubbles enter the circulation through the ruptured alveoli, circulate up to the brain and potentially cause paralysis, weakness, loss of consciousness or fatalities. The problem is that unfortunately not only bubble related problems associated with lung overexpansion but also the transfer of venous gas either through a potential shunt in the heart or even just some large bridging blood vessels in the lung would also allow arterialization of gas bubbles. In other words, you can get bubbles injected or transferred into the arterial system not only because you ruptured a lung but also because the venous gas 
traps or filters have failed. So now we're already starting to blur the boundaries between decompression sickness and arterial gas embolism because bubbles from tissues and bubbles from ruptured lungs can both produce gas embolism. And for operational or clinical reasons, we have now started using decompression illness as an umbrella term because that really captures both concepts and the treatment is largely the same oxygen and recompression. So the value of separating the two to a certain extent is less important. But that doesn't mean that we should just throw everything under the basket of decompression illness either. In other words, that we could conceivably over-diagnose it. Now on the topic of diagnosis, of course, we've got a problem because there's no specific blood test for decompression illness. I can't subject you to a, uh, a blood sample or a urine sample, so that's pretty much the list of specific tests that we have for decompression illness. So, for the most part, we've got history. We've got what the diver tells us, bearing in mind it may not be accurate, and we've got a range of presentations and exposures that may or may not be more likely uh, the result of decompression illness, leaving us with what we've been teaching for years. Basically, anything weird after a dive is a bend unless it's something else. But that leaves this very widely open to interpretation and angst, paranoia, and divers sometimes are becoming extremely uncomfortable and extremely anxious about what could be very easily explained by an experienced diving physician. The trend that we found before the turn of the millennium, decompression illness was definitely underdiagnosed. We had a lot of people with obvious symptoms that were not being referred for treatment. And this still happens, particularly if it's inconvenient to the dive operator to refer them or if it's in a location that is perhaps difficult to get to. But over the past four years, I have to say the pendulum seems to be swinging the other way, where people are sometimes overly concerned about having symptoms related to decompression illness. Now please, this is a mature crowd. I don't want you to walk away and say, well, just blow everything off. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, I'd like to give you some pointers on how we can truly start thinking about how reasonable it is uh, to attribute a particular sign or symptom to decompression illness. First of all, we have the so-called 24-hour rule. In other words, it is extremely rare for first symptoms of decompression illness to arise beyond 24 hours of a dive. So if someone starts complaining of initial symptoms with no previous symptoms beyond 24 hours, the chances of decompression illness are extremely unlikely unless they've been exposed to altitude, in which case we would stretch that to 36 hours, or a prolonged transatlantic flight where one might move that to 48 hours. So there are some time boundaries that one can use to reduce the probability of something being decompression illness related. The second thing is that bubbles aren't magical. There are certain things they do. They block and they inflame. They disrupt and they clot. And if you bear those mechanisms in mind and you now just look at what tissues are involved, it's not that difficult to determine what sort of symptoms you're likely to get. And that's what I'm going to share with you this afternoon. In other words, just giving you more definition in the type of symptoms and signs associated with decompression illness. Now the skin, of course, has a massive amount of circulation. So if there are circulating bubbles, the chances are that they're going to pass through the skin. The skin, though, in and of itself is not a particularly vulnerable organ. Our skin is used to having a, a very variable circulation. Those of you sitting here with warm clothes have probably got cold hands, which means that there's not much circulation going to your fingertips, and they don't just drop off. So there's a tremendous resistance to interruption or reduced circulation in the skin. We're not worried primarily about the skin. It's more about what it's telling us in terms of decompression stress. So if the skin looks weird, then what is going on elsewhere in the body? That's the point. 
Now, there are many different types of rashes that you can get, relate to all kinds of things, but the type of rash that we are most concerned about in diving is called cutis marmorata. It's most common amongst middle-aged women, and it is typically around the truncle and the areas with uh, greater adipose deposits. But this is a male, as you can obviously see, and you see this blotchy rash, and in fact, if you push, push with your fingers, it actually displaces the rash. This person did three relatively deep dives in quick succession, also had in ear decompression illness and died four months later uh, after a dive off Port Alfred. But at this stage he was relatively asymptomatic and many divers that do have this rash don't have other symptoms. But some do and they do need to have assessment. This is also a rash and in this light you can't really see that this is a dry suit squeeze. And this diver came with this rash we did not treat him for the rash, but he also had shoulder pain related to a prolonged decompression. And that was decompression illness. But all rashes are not decompression illness. Let's look at joints. Now, of course, you know that the Grecian bend was one of the first descriptions of decompression illness. People walking with a sort of arthritic gait. But let's look at which joints actually are most vulnerable to decompression. This is essentially a skeleton and it's not any and every bone that's vulnerable to decompression illness. In fact, it's not the axial skeleton but the appendicular skeleton. In other words, it's the limbs attached to the, uh, uh, the rib cage, etc. and the pelvis. Those are the bones that are more vulnerable to developing problems and they have fat within their cavities, unlike the others that have bone marrow that produces uh, blood. So those are the types of bones that are the most vulnerable. And for flying and bounce diving, the shoulder is the most common joint versus saturation and tunnel work, which is the hip and knee joint. So the shoulder joint is the most common for sport divers. Other joints can be affected, but that's the most common one. But are all shoulder-related aches after a dive necessarily decompression illness? And the answer is no. Again, let's bring this down to a level where we can reason it through. There's only so much you've got in a joint that can ache. And those parts are inside the joint itself, which may be subjected to tension or circulatory issues. You have the tissues around the joint, such as the tendons, that can be stretched. You also have the bone marrow or the bone cavity, if you like, that can be disrupted and you also have nerves that may be affected distantly but give you a ref so-called referred pain that you experience in that particular joint. Let me just show you the one that we're most concerned about. This is actually looking inside the medulla of the bone and you can actually see fat cells here, you can see the blood vessels there circulating red blood cells. It's very easy to see that there can be disruption and transfer of, of gas here and the typical pain or, or ache that we're concerned about in decompression illness causes disruption of this circulation and therefore if you can imagine deep inside the bone causes an ache, a deep ache that is poorly localized and is not affected by motion because it's inside the stick of the bone. So it's not going to be affected by motion as such. So let me ask you guys whether you can put two and two together. There are basically two broad categories of pain you may have related to a joint. It may be sharp or it may be deep and boring. Now, if it's a sharp pain and it's affected by movement, reason with me. You've got a pain, you can put your finger on it, and when you move it, it aches. What is that most likely to be in relation to the joint structures? Right, so it's most likely then to be related to one of the moving parts. And it is true, you can get bubble release in tendons and so on, but even if it is, it's basically in the category of a bruise and it's probably going to respond to oxygen and anti-inflammatories and the chances of permanent damage are remote in truth and the workshops on mild decompression illness have borne that out if it's unaffected by movement in other words if it's sort of a it's there you can sort of rub it but you don't quite know what it is and movement doesn't seem to affect it then it's probably a localized inflammation but it's not a particular moving part 
it's not the rope and the pulley, it's sort of the tissues around that area. Again, this type of pain is unlikely to have a bad outcome in isolation, especially if the dive was relatively minor. How about this one? It's a deep sort of an aching sort of pain, but the first one is affected by movement. What could that be? You can't quite put your finger on it, but as you move the knee, for instance, it sort of aches. Where would that be? It could be bone against bone or certainly in that area and that would be joint capsule. In other words, if you've got gas inside the joint capsule and you're moving it and stretching that, that would give you a deep sort of aching, gnawing pain, not the typical sharp pain you can put a finger on. Again, even if that is gas, it's unlikely to cause any long-term problems. It will absorb eventually, obviously faster with recompression, but the chances of long-term problems are remote. Okay, I'm not blowing it off, I'm bringing balance to this. Okay. The last one is this deep ache or boring pain. Some people say that it feels as if there are teeth in the bone. It really, really hurts, similar to cancer bone pain. And that's pain related to the medulla. In other words, where the blood vessels are blocked, there's engorgement, there's swelling, there's pressure inside the bone. Those are the ones we definitely want to treat because there is mechanistically an association with bone death, bone rot, dysbaric osteonecrosis. Okay? So while some of these might be bubble related, they are still of a relatively minor nature and could essentially be described as a sports injury. It's almost like an ankle sprain. They should ultimately do relatively well with or without recompression. Obviously, you're not going to make the decision on your own. You would call the Dan hotline for another person. Obviously, you'd want to have those people assessed. But if people with these lesions ultimately don't go for recompression after proper assessment, don't be concerned that someone was now negligent. It's not unreasonable to sometimes not treat these minor cases. The INI is another area that is often very confused and to keep it interesting I'm going to ask you to see if you can make the diagnosis in these categories. What is the ear problem in this case? You've got a diver, descends to six meters, complains of pain, pain gets worse, they hear a pop in the ear, after that the pain's gone, within about 30 seconds they start feeling vertigo and spinning and disorientation, that settles within about two minutes, afterwards they've got no problems, they surface with a bit of fullness in the ear and maybe a little bit of blood stained fluid from the ear. What's that likely to be? Barotrauma with perforation. Right. Try the next one. 18 meters, descent, pain, feels fullness in the ear, and within the hour of surfacing or next hour of surfacing, there's hearing loss or ringing in the ears. The point here is that the person had difficulty clearing and battled throughout the dive, so there were a lot of strenuous maneuvers in trying to equalize. It could be middle ear and you certainly see signs of it, but one of the concerns we have is that there's a mild form of inner ear barotrauma that actually also causes damage. It doesn't have a rupture like a fistula, but these people actually do need treatment and often cortisone to preserve their hearing. So this is perhaps one of the under-diagnosed diving-related problems we do see. Let's try this one. 10 meters. Forceful attempts, continues to dive, reaches the surface, picks up the dive tank and suddenly they have whirling vertigo and uh, hearing loss as well. Notice the depth. What's that likely to be? That's also in the ear barotrauma, but in this case there's a fistula. In other words, there's a leak, loss of fluid, the hydraulic system is failing and these people are severely disoriented. Okay, so they may even need surgery after five days conservative treatment. This one then, 24 meters, ascends to 5 meters, experiences a bit of fullness in the one ear, then experiences vertigo, but there's no tinnitus or hearing loss, reaches the surface with fullness, a bit of a reverse block sense, the vertigo stops promptly within 10 minutes and there's nothing else going on. What is that most likely to be? Reverse block. Reverse block, and then the specific modality for the vertigo we call alternobaric vertigo. All right, and this is the easy one, of course, 75 meters and trimix, 90 minute ascent, a ring in the ears, then vertigo, hearing loss, vertigo gets worse, and then, of course, just to make it really easy, got a blotchy skin and a, and a painful joint. So, what's that? Okay, so that's decompression illness. So, can you see, one can think these things through.
I'm not expecting you to make diagnoses, but I want you to be partners in the decision-making process, also to counsel these people afterwards, because if it wasn't decompression illness, and there was an obvious explanation, we don't want them to be psychologically crippled that it actually was decompression illness, but they weren't treated properly. And that's something that I have seen over the years. We need to move people through this. Again, it's about this concern that people have, and rightly so, up to a point. But getting the appropriate advice really can make a big difference. Let's look at the central nervous system and to some extent the peripheral nerves because again there's a lot of angst about what's going on in your brain. You know, I've got a bubble in the brain, I've got a bubble in the spinal cord. Let's bring this to reality. The types of injuries that bubbles might cause in the brain are either going to be bubbles that physically go into the brain or they may be the result of bleeding as a result of the traumatic injuries associated with bubble expansion. So those are the mechanisms involved. Now, Let's look at how quickly these types of symptoms arise after a dive. This is a composite of James Francis's work, basically in the order of a thousand divers. They, they eliminated all of those that seemed to possibly have had a pulmonary related overpressure injury and they then looked which were the ones that presented with cerebral, in other words obviously brain problems, and they looked at the ones with obvious spinal cord problems and paralysis. So that's during decompression, immediately upon surfacing, 5, 10, 15, 30, 60 minutes and on. Where do you think the brain decompression illnesses are going to manifest? Where are you going to see most of them? Soon or late? Soon, as might be expected. But let me remind you that the slide you're looking at here is not associated with uh, pulmonary barotrauma. These are not people that have had lung overpressure injuries. They must have had a venous gas embolism. In other words, there was a shunting of decompression gas bubbles across to, uh, to the arterial system. And you can see that 75% of them actually occurred within 10 minutes. Now for that to happen, the only mechanism that we're aware of is embolism. Okay, And obviously these people need treatment. We mentioned previously it's not only pulmonary barotrauma, but it may be a hole in the heart or it may be um, bridges between the blood vessels in the lung. And these people did not seem to have uh, lung overpressure injuries. The target organs, if you've got gas embolism, obviously the heart will give you arrhythmias, the brain will give you unconsciousness or paralysis. Other organs also get the bubbles. If we do blood tests, we can sometimes see that muscle has been damaged and other organs have been damaged, but they don't cause a critical dysfunction as the heart and brain would. But you're looking at the bottom of the brain and basically, depending on where the bubbles go, you can have anything between incoordination, weakness, blindness, and so on. And those symptoms are rapid onset, easy to identify. This is a, a rabbit brain. You can see the skull removed and what you may have seen is the shower of bubbles going through. Did you see it? You'll see it again. You see this sort of a tracking of bubbles. Now the point that I'm making here is the bubbles don't stay stuck. They actually push through. The blood pressure actually goes up and forces those bubbles through. Which means that in many cases when people get these uh, problems they don't necessarily die immediately and they don't necessarily remain dysfunctional either. This is a study by Tom Newman showing that between 5 and 10 percent of obvious gas embolism situations may result in a fatality, but that means 90 to 95 percent of these people actually don't die immediately and in fact a large number of them, 60 percent here, recover as those bubbles are pushed through. But these people will give you the history that they did the dive, they reached the surface, they really were completely out of it, they were even paralyzed on the one side. People said, well, it's just hypothermia. The symptoms would then recover and they say, oh, but that wasn't anything. Well, here I think the problem is obviously the reverse from what I was describing with joints. In joints it's often overdiagnosed, but these transient episodes of severe neurological incapacitation that recover spontaneously are things we should pay attention to even if they recover, because there may be some residual problems, just like people that have a minor stroke that recovers partially but still need treatment, or they may subsequently within six hours relapse, and you could have avoided it if they were treated properly.
So be aware of these cases that are under-treated. Spinal cord. Now in spinal cord, amazingly enough, you still have a relatively short latency. In other words, in Francis's work, he still found that most of the spinal cord rapid onset paralysis was within about 10 minutes. So whatever mechanism we're looking at needs to explain why those symptoms happen so quickly. And the bottom line, without giving you too much detail and being too technical about it, if it occurs after a 30 meter dive within about 10 minutes, it's probably physical bubbles occurring inside the spinal cord. It's called autochthonous bubbles because that's pretty much the only mechanism that fits that particular onset. The problem with those sorts of bubbles, if you recompress them, the bubbles may collapse and you'd get miraculous recovery, or those bubbles may actually prompt a bleed, in which case those treatments are completely resistant to recompression. And that's often what we find. Rapid onset, paralysis, treatment, fixed, or treatment, 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 does not recover. And people then go deeper, they go longer, more expensive, saturation, and the point is you're no longer treating a bubble, you're treating a blood clot. Okay, so that's one of the challenges we face. Then if it takes anywhere after half an hour to maybe six hours, you're dealing with a combination of arterial inflow problems, venous outflow problems, inflammation and so on. And if it's beyond six hours, then it's usually related to inflammation and leaking of, of proteins and fluids. And those respond very well to recompression, fluids and oxygen. All right, now let's look at the, the peripheral nerves and if you've got a spinal cord related bubble, it tends to give you a concentric disturbance. Imagine the developing embryo you could think of as a worm, okay, you've got this long um, cylinder and you've got rings called somites that become dermatomes and of course the legs extend downwards and the arms extend downwards but if you were to spread out your arms and legs you'd still preserve that division of dermatomal uh, distribution of the nerves, blood vessels and so on. So a lesion in the spinal cord tends to give you that ring-like loss and often if it's a significant lesion you'd also lose all the discs lower down because the signals travel from top to bottom. So a spinal cord lesion tends to give you a fairly discreet lesion, ring-like, and obviously if it's down an arm it would, it would uh, involve a particular part of the arm. But I want to contrast that to what we could call compression neuropraxia. And I'm going to let you experiment with your own bodies and elicit some of these symptoms in a moment. The one that you're most familiar with is hitting your funny bone. Okay? If you hit your funny bone, you've basically caused a dent in the ulnar nerve and it gives you a weird, tingly, burny sensation downstream in the supply line of that peripheral nerve. It's not the same as a disc-like lesion and it doesn't affect any other part of your body. It's just that area. So with that, let's look at some of the common causes of what we call mononeuropathies. In other words, a peripheral nerve being dinged and giving people tingles that may cause them a lot of anxiety. And the first one is the one that I just mentioned and that's the ulnar one. Now what I'd like you to do is to find the ulnar groove and if you can get your thumb in there, just uh, crunch down and it's just under that bony ledge until you, until you can feel the ring finger and pinky go a bit numb. Can you feel that? Okay. So what you find is if you injure the ulnar nerve around that level, you only feel it in the hand and only in the pinky and half of the ring finger on the palm side of the hand. So that's the classic drunk or uh, maybe cramped um, passenger in an airline's type of lesion. They fall asleep, they wake up, they've got tingles in their hand, that's where it is. And it's restricted to the palm of the hand. It doesn't go up the arm, it's only in the hand. Of course, wetsuits or uh, leaning on, on that part of the arm, all of those things might impinge on the ulnar nerve and give you problems. This one you probably know if you uh, operate windows with a mouse, okay? The carpal tunnel syndrome is perhaps the more common name that's attributed to it, but basically you've got what is called the median nerve that runs in the center of the, the palm and it supplies the other fingers that the uh, ulnar nerve didn't supply, so thumb, 
um, index and, and middle finger and sometimes half of the, of the ring finger and you will have numbness or tingling there and sometimes weakness also on the side of, of the thumb. If you like you can crunch down in the middle of your palm just to sort of use that Chinese acupressure point for, for nausea which is where they apply the wristbands. It's on the median nerve and you'll start noticing there's a bit of tingling over the thumb and, um, and the adjacent fingers. Okay so that is obviously related to the median nerve and one of the ways that you can get that again is with a wetsuit or if people have been resting on the gunnel of, of uh, the dive boat a lot of vibration that caused additional inflammation and irritation very easy for them to get that sort of uh, a lesion but it is so so region specific it's just the hand it's just those fingers it truly is basically impossible for that to be decompression illness because it is such a classic localized lesion okay Right, now this is the one that's fun to find. You need to sort of, you need to sort of dig into this, you know, this sort of hollow just above the, uh, the collarbone and you'll find as you, as you finger your way around this, a sort of ah sort of area that you'll find and you'll immediately start feeling pain over your elbow. If you just sort of rub it, there's usually sort of a bit of a bundle there and as you rub over it, you'll immediately sort of feel a down into your elbow. Who's found it? Raise the operating arm after you've done that. Okay, so most of you found it. Now that's a classic one that is um, hurt when you wear a heavy BC and you've been mobilizing equipment. And then people will also have the tingle, but in this case the tingling involves the entire lower arm as well as those two fingers. Okay, so it's slightly different from the ulnar one, which is only the palm. The inferior brachial plexus is the underarm as well, but it's still related to a nerve, peripheral nerve lesion, not a bubble somewhere doing mischief. So uh, as I say, you know, heavy BCs, especially slim individuals, um, that is a very common occurrence. Then the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, it sort of runs here under a ligament and towards the side. It gives you a classic patch here over the side of the thigh. If you have a significant um, tissue accumulation that may impinge together with a, a, a weight belt, it's quite common to get that discrete area being numb. And that is again inconceivable in relation to decompression illness. There's really no way a bubble would be that discrete. And then lastly, a form of sciatica, although this is due to typically pressure in sitting over a ledge like this on a dive boat, then giving you a sense of weakness and even paralysis in the very lower parts of the leg. But it's very limited, it's not like a spinal lesion, and it's very specifically related to the distribution of the sciatic nerve. So I'm just pointing these out. I'm not expecting you to be diagnosticians, but I hope that after listening to me speak, you will realize that ignored paralysis, weakness and neurological function that recovers is actually the thing you should be concerned about. Whereas ache in a joint that responds to motion is sharp is typically less serious than we have thought. And these discrete areas of pins and needles that are easily explainable due to a localized lesion on a nerve are really something that one can reassure people on. Okay, again, please continue the standard party line, which is when in doubt, think of decompression illness. I don't want you to no longer think that you should consult Dan. Please don't get that message after today's talk. Call Dan, but realize that there are these collections of symptoms. It's not completely implausible. We can put two and two together with a history and symptoms, and we can come up with a reasonable response. Thank you very much.